be yourself, love who you are, and be compassionate, and then give that love and compassion and kindness to everyone around you, and it will always come back to you. Hi there, and welcome back. In this video, we're looking at a more advanced Python concept called typing. Python is what's known as a dynamic language. In a dynamic language, we don't specify what type of data a variable holds. For example, here we've got a cursor. And we're not saying that this cursor has to be a specific type, like an integer or a string or a cursor object. In other programming languages, like Java, for example, you would say cursor, cursor. You know, this cursor has to be of type cursor, whatever class this is. But in Python, you don't have to say that. Similarly, if you create a variable with the value 5, in Java, you would have to say int x is 5, because that specifies that x has to be an integer at all times. And if you were to do this, you would get an error, because the string 5 is not an integer. Java is a statically typed language, a language where you have to specify the type of variables as you create them. But Python is a dynamically typed language, which means you don't have to do that. It means you are a bit more flexible because your variable can change types between executions if you want. And also, there is a bit less code to write because you don't have to constantly define what every variable is. However, it also has some drawbacks. And the main drawback is that sometimes you can use a variable thinking it is one thing, but really it's something else. And you're not clear about that because you don't have anything that tells you what type it is. For example, if you have a variable called friends, and it's a tuple of your friends, at some point later on the program, maybe you forget it's a tuple, and down here you try to do friends.append something. Obviously, this wouldn't work because you can't append on a tuple, but because you weren't seeing this code at that moment in time, you didn't realize that. That's one of the problems with dynamically typed languages like Python. So, Python has introduced in Python 3 the concept of typing, where you can tell your editor, PyCharm, and some other third-party programs what your functions return and what your parameter types should be, so that when you're programming, it's a bit clearer what you're doing. Here's an example on how you might tell, what, uh, tell Python what your function returns. For example, this create book table returns none, and we know that because all Python functions return none by default if you don't include a return statement. So what can you do? You can tell Python that when you call this function, you expect it to return none. And you do this like so. After the function definition, but before the colon, you put this dash greater than none. Now when you go back to app.py, and you've got here database.createBookTable, you can say something like my variable equals that, but notice how now PyCharm gives you this squiggly line underneath and it says create book table doesn't return anything. Therefore, you probably don't want to assign it to a variable because that's pretty pointless, since the value is going to be none. If you remove the none, which you can do, of course, it's totally optional, that now disappears because PyCharm is not aware that the function doesn't return anything. Okay, so again, you can include these type hints, that's what they're called, but they are not enforced by Python. These are only useful when you're developing in PyCharm or when you use a couple other pieces of software that will analyze your code and tell you when you are doing like things like assigning a variable to a function that is meant to return none. When you run your program, Python completely ignores these type hints and it doesn't do anything with them. You won't get any errors for using them incorrectly or for assigning to a variable the return value of this function, even if it is none. So again, these are only just for you. And the, the most common use case is when you are developing with PyCharm because PyCharm makes good use of these things. Okay. Similarly, the add book function also returns none, so we can make it return none there. 
Now, when you call the function, if you try to assign it to a variable, once again, you'll get a wee message saying, hey, this function doesn't return anything. Are you sure you want to do this? So that's for each function. Let's go and add a return value for each function in our database interface. I'm going to ignore the get all books for now. We'll do this one at the end. So as you can see, all our functions return none. And we can add that in. Now we can go back to get all books. And we can say that this is going to return a list of dicts because it returns a list of dictionaries here. Of course, we get red squiggly lines because PyCharm doesn't know what these two are, so we have to go and import them. Whenever you want to import anything that's related to type hinting, like this here, we can import it from the typing module. This is new in Python 3.5. And there we have it. Now it's happy that it's returning a list of dictionaries. If you want, you can also tell it what each of the keys and values are. So you could say inside brackets, str, which means string, this is the string class for the keys, and str for the values. That would say that every key is a string and every value is a string. Now, of course, we know that the red status can be an integer. Therefore, we must do something else. We have to do that the keys can be strings, all of the keys are strings, name, author, and red, but the values are a union of string and integer. And again, we have to import this, of course, from the typing module. Now this says that this function returns a list of dictionaries where each key is a string and each value is either a string or an integer. Notice that's what the union does, and this is what the dict does. Now, in order to simplify, we can actually create our own types, which is pretty exciting. We can cut this code here. I'm going to cut it with uh, Command X or Control X in Windows and say that it's going to return a list of books. Then we can go up to the top and say that book is what we cut earlier. A book type is a new type that is a dict of strings to strings or integers. And then down here, we can use our new book type to simplify our code and make it a bit more explicit exactly what's going on. Notice that when you create a new type, because it's sort of like a class, even though it's not used as a class, you normally would give them a capital letter to begin with. This is just the convention. You can, of course, give them lowercase letters if you want, and that's totally fine. Okay, now that we've looked at return values, we can now look at the parameters the name is going to be a string. So you'd think that we would do this. However, this dash and greater than is only used for return values. When you want to determine or define the type of a parameter, you use the colon here. Mildly confusing because the colon is normally used to signal the start of a block. This is the one of the few times where you use a colon to determine something else. This and list slicing are two examples that come to the top of my head. Author is also going to be a string, so that's that. Notice that if you go over to app py into the add book function and you replace name by something that's not a string, like five, PyCharm now gives you this yellow background that is not so readable. And it says expected type str got int. So it can help you when you're developing, but Python is not going to enforce this when you are coding. So if you do type five there and you run the program, you won't get any errors. You'll just input the name as five and then you get an error in SQLite because the type is defined as a, uh, as a text. Going back to database, we can do the same for any other functions that need parameters like mark book as read, also a string, and delete book, also a string. Okay. Not too many of Python's libraries and projects and things like that use type hinting because it is quite new, but I can recommend using it in your projects. It will help you over time as your projects grow. And also it sort of gives you a bit more readability in terms of, okay, what's going to happen with the name here? It's a string, so probably going to use it as a string. Then you won't try to append things to it inside this function, for example. Indeed, if you try to do name.append, 
it'll tell you that this is unlikely. Unresolved reference uh, append for class string. PyCharm now thinks that name is a string, even though it doesn't have any context on where it was defined, just because you said that it should be a string. So if you try to append something as if it were a list, it will tell you this is wrong. Of course, if you change this to a list, now you can do name.append and notice how it already likes it and it tells you, hey, you can append here. Okay, so type hinting, pretty useful, helps you, helps PyCharm, gives you good suggestions. And overall, as your apps grow, it's going to help them stay a bit more maintainable. So definitely a good thing to be doing. Feel free to do that for other functions in here. But the most important functions for you to do that in are those functions that you're going to call and receive values from. Your menus and things like that, probably not so important since nothing's calling them and they are not taking any parameters. So there's not much to define there. You could return the function, you could define that the function returns none, but because nothing's calling this function other than you up here, it doesn't matter much. I wouldn't worry too much about doing that. Okay, we can go over to the database connection and we can also define that the enter method is going to return something. And what is going to return is not a type from the typing module, but a type from the SQLite 3 module. That's SQLite 3 dot connection. Notice that the connection here is not a type per se, it is an actual class. It is something that you can create and that indeed, this connection gets created when you call SQLite 3 dot connect. And that's fine. You can tell PyCharm that this is going to return a proper class. Totally cool. It doesn't have to be a type from the typing module. It doesn't have to be str or int. It can be an actual class that you have defined or that is defined in some other module. Now, when we go over to database.py, PyCharm will be able to advise us that the connection object has all these things from the SQLite module, which is pretty handy. Okay. So again, good for you, good for PyCharm, good for your projects as they grow. Definitely recommend that you do this. So that's it for this video, and I'll see you on the next one. Beauty is that we're all unique. Yeah. We're not all the same. Your identity doesn't come from a size or a shape. You are you and you don't need to look like other people. Don't try to become someone, you know. And maybe you are more beautiful, not just physically, but in so many other ways. Hi and welcome back. In this video, I just wanted to give you some further reading on type hinting. Type hinting in Python is not a very large thing. There's not a lot to read, not a lot to, to know. But nonetheless, a couple of sites that you may want to go and visit if you want to learn more about type hinting. The first one is, of course, the official Python documentation for the typing module. And it has a lot of information here about what types are the, the most fundamental types, any being any type, the union that we've looked at, tuple, callable, type bar, and generic. And you can read a bit more about them. And it also gives you some code samples, for example, on how to define your own types, as we saw in the last video. Um, for to, how to simplify complex type signatures when you have a type that is maybe here a, a, a list of tuples of tuples that has dicks in them. Uh, and it tells you a bit of how to simplify them. It talks about new types. It talks about generics and how you can achieve them. Generally, more advanced things, but a useful thing to read. And if you want to go in a bit um, more basic, but not really more basic, mind you, you can go and read PEP483. PEP483 is the theory of type hints. It's meant to be a slightly more beginner-friendly intro to type hinting, but it is not terribly simple. So you still need some focus in here and some time to, to truly understand it. But it essentially, it says why type hinting was added to Python and it gives you a bit of information on how to go about it. So these two are linked in the resources section for this lecture. Feel free to have a read through them and ask any questions if you have any. I'll see you on the next video. In one second, you realize that the point of maximum danger is the point of minimum fear. It's bliss. God placed the best things in life on the other side of terror. 
On the other side of your maximum fear are all of the best things in life. Hey guys, welcome back. And in this video, we're talking about generators in Python. I'm really excited for this section because we're going to talk about some more advanced stuff. And generators are one of these topics in Python that a lot of courses don't even mention. But they are essential for performance and also because the async development in Python, the asynchronous development that we're going to be learning later on, is built upon these generators. When you understand generators, a lot of things in Python start becoming a lot clearer. So what is a generator? A generator in Python is a function, but it's a special function. It's a function that remembers the state it's in, in between executions. So you can run the function multiple times, and it will remember what it did the last time that you ran it. So that sounds pretty weird. Let me explain with an example. Imagine you wanted to build a list of 100 numbers. Very straightforward. You want to get a new list with numbers from 0 to 99, not including 100. So you could make a function like this one, obviously not using range and so forth, you know, you know, range. But let's not use range. Instead, let's build a list from scratch. How would you do it? A good way to do it would be to start with an empty list. Say, call it nums and make it equal to an empty list. And also start with an index equal to zero. Then while i is less than 100, say nums.append i. So you're going to append zero at the start. Then you're going to increment i by one, which is going to make it into one. You're going to append one, repeat, append two, then three, and so forth, until you get to 99. And at the end of this function, return nums, which is your list of numbers. If we do print 100 numbers, and we run that, we can see that it contains here our list of 100 numbers. Of course, we could use list comprehension for this, we could use the range function, but for now, let's assume this is a cool way of doing it. Because what I'm really explaining is essentially how the range function works on the inside. So we construct a list, fill it with the first 100 numbers, and then return them. Now we have 100 numbers in a list. This entire list is in your computer's memory stored as this, this return value of the function. Now, 100 numbers is not very big. It's quite a small amount of space. But let's say we wanted to store 10 million. Million is like 100 numbers but it would be something like a million numbers. You would generate a list of a million numbers and store it in this variable that goes into your computer's memory and it's presumably a bigger, bigger amount of memory that it's taken because each one of these numbers is taking up a small amount of your computer's memory. If you wanted 10 million numbers, then it is bigger and so forth. Now, the having 10 million numbers, not a great example, but just imagine you have a very long list of something. And for example, these are often used in, in calculating prime numbers and in big data and things like that. You maybe sometimes want big lists of things. So a generator is used to circumvent this problem because the assumption is you don't need 100 numbers all at once. What you need is zero so that you can do something with it and then one so that you can do something with it, and then two so you can do something with it. For example, with this 100 numbers, we could then go and multiply them all by two and store them in another list. How would you do that? You'd do something like list comprehension, x times two for x in 100 numbers. What you're doing here is you're using this list to iterate over it and multiply each number by two. Let's think that this multiplication by 2 is an operation that we want to do in these numbers in order to calculate something. Another example would be if you have a lot of users and you wanted to calculate the engagement around them or how engaged they are with your system or something like that. Essentially, you want to go over each element and perform an operation. But the thing here is you don't need all the elements at once. You need them one by one. So this is what generators are used for. Instead of having the entire list of elements, what you do is the generator gives you the first element of the list without storing all of the list in memory. The next time you call the generator, it remembers the element it gave you last, and it knows to give you the second element. 
and then you run it again and it gives you the third element and so forth. So it never stores the list in memory. It always only remembers the last number that it gave you. So it can then give you the next one. You have to run the function every time you want a new number. And that's why it's called a generator, because it generates numbers, or indeed strings or users or whatever it is that you want to generate. So here's how you would do it. Instead of nums.append i, you say yield num. No, sorry, yield i. For i is the number that we want to return. We no longer need this nums equal square brackets, and we no longer need the return statement either. So now this function here is called a generator function. Yield is very much like return, but what happens is it gives you i when you call it, and then it remembers that it's, it's here. It's stopped right before line five, right after line four, there in the middle. Next time you call the function, it will continue. So what it'll do is it'll increment i by one. It will rerun the loop and yield one give you one and then stop. Next time you call it, it will continue, increment i by one and repeat the loop and then give you two and then it will stop and so forth. Eventually, when you run out of numbers, it will yield none. And then you know that it's finished. Okay, so how are we going to do this? Let's first of all, print out 100 numbers. Notice how it no longer gives us a list. Now it gives us a generator object, which is called 100 numbers. That's the name of our function. And then it also gives us the memory address of our object. Notice how we defined a function, but the print is telling us this is an object. Because Python in the background realizes that you've used yield, you're making a generator, and it turns this into a Python object. I'll tell you how to make these objects yourself without a function uh, later on. So let's store our generator in a variable. I'm going to call it G. That's a fairly popular name for a generator in a small program. If you have many generators, of course, you'll have to go for a more descriptive name. And then we're going to print the next value that the generator would give us. Notice that when you initialize a generator like so, it doesn't run the function. It starts at the very top without running at all. And when you ask it for the next value, it will run up until the yield and give you whatever value you've yielded. And the way you ask it for the next value is you don't run the function again, but you say next of g. So next is a built-in function that affects generators, and it tells it to go up to the yield. Okay, so if we run this, you can see now we get zero, because that's the very first number yielded. Now, our generator, g, has stopped here at the line 4.5, between 4 and 5. So, if we ask it for another number, notice that, of course, at the end of our program, the generator is destroyed. So, if we run this program again, this will be 0 again, and this will be 1 now. It doesn't remember it across program executions. That's, that's just not how Python works. So now we can ask it for the first number, and then for the next number. After the first number, it'll be, st it'll be stopped between 4 and 5. Then, when we say next, it continues up until the next yield, which means repeating this loop once and gives us 1. Okay? Very important. The function remembers where it stopped. So at any point, you can stop the function from running, and then you can call next in order to continue it. So it's not useful only for you know, generating numbers or whatever. It's also useful when you want to stop a function from running temporarily, and then you can continue running it whenever you want by calling next on it. So that's maybe not something that makes too much sense just now, but just remember that for we will need it when we do asynchronous programming. So what about the range function? I said earlier that this was explaining essentially how the range function works on the inside. And that's true. But the range function doesn't give you a generator directly. Here, let's 
my do something like my range object it's going to be range 10 this behaves very much like a generator but if you call next of my range object you get an error and look at that and that's because the range object isn't quite a generator even though it behaves in this way it doesn't give you it doesn't generate a list and then allows you to iterate over it it behaves in this generation ish manner to be more efficient my range object though you can remember that we printed it out much earlier on in the course and we received some weird range 0 to 10 thing that's just the wrapper function being called and as you can see if we print out the wrapper outcome we also see range of 0 to 10 so my range object is something that behaves very much like this we're going to learn in a couple of videos time exactly how we can iterate over an object in order to make it behave like the range object so we've learned about these generators and uh, one more thing I wanted to mention actually about the generators is the list function can turn a generator into a list so we can print list of G notice here what we've called next then next again and then list so now we have zero and one printed out for those are the two things in our next functions and then we've generated a list of the generator but that list of course continues from where we left off the generator itself remembers where it was so then the list starts from two not from zero so it's really important to remember in generators they remember where they were so when you create one that's it from from essentially the moment you start using it the moment you start calling next on it it remembers where it is and you can't go backwards okay now in the next few videos we're going to learn more about generators we're going to learn about generator classes how you can create a class that behaves like a generator and we're also going to learn about iterators and iterables in python and the range objectives is one such example then we're going to move on to some functional programming examples like filter map any and all and enumerate so pretty excited for this section I'm, I'm i'm confident that generators are going to be something that you are going to need in your python development particularly as we move on further in the course so with that said i'll see you on the next video if you are full of life you naturally choose something difficult and dangerous if you have no life then you will only choose comfort now this has become the thing, everybody talking about their comfort zone, it's a death zone. Hi and welcome back. In this video we're talking about generator classes and iterators. Here I'm going to show you a class which implements the hundred number generator we did in the last video. So I'm going to call it first hundred generator. Um, like so and then we're going to define an init method which is just going to start the number off as zero and then we're going to define a next underscore underscore next method when you define a next method in a class any object you can then call next of my object like so so this is again a dunder method that allows you to call next on it it also tells Python something pretty important. We're going to look at that in just a moment. So, if we wanted to generate 100 numbers, all that we have to do is get self.number, return it, and increment it by 1. So, if self.number is less than 100, we're not going to use the yield keyword here, by the way, because you don't need to in a class generator. Uh, sorry, in, in one of these things. <laughs> I'm just going to not say anything that could potentially be misconstrued as wrong. Um, just so I don't confuse you. What to do is, if the number is less than 100, we put that in a variable. Then we increment the number by 1. And then we return the current number, which was the previous value. So that's 0. We increment self.number by 1. We return 0. Okay. Now, important, 
on a class, we have to, if we want to stop returning numbers like so, we're not using a loop here to, to stop us when we reach 100. So when we reach 100, we have to raise a special error, which is called stop iteration. Stop iteration error tells Python that we've reached the end of this generator. I'm saying generator, I'm flinching slightly um, here. Because this is essentially a generator in that you start at zero, then you decide whether you want to return a new number. You get that number and then you return it and then the program stops. But your object remains and it remembers self.number. So if we have my gen and that's a first hundred generator there, my gen dot number is of course zero at the start, right? Let's, let's show you that. My gen dot number is zero at the start. If you do my gen dot next, like so, and then print my gen dot number again, you get one. That makes sense, right? Because the next method here is checking if the number is less than 100, then incrementing it by one. So this all makes sense. Now, in order to make it behave like a generator, we just say next of my gen, like so. Then we can run this again, and the same thing comes out. Of course, next of my gen is actually returning the number that it had before we incremented it. So instead of printing mygen.number here, we can just print next of my gen, and here we can also print next of my gen, and we'll get the same output 0 and 1. The first time we call next, we get the current value, which is 0, but we've incremented self.number by 1. The next time we call next, we again increment self.number by 1, but we'd return the previous value, which is 1. So now this is behaving exactly like a generator, and indeed, this is a generator. It's not storing all of the values up to 100 in a list. It's giving you them one by one. It's generating them as you call the next function. Sorry, the next method. By the way, dunder next is new in Python 3, so if you're using Python 2, you'll have to define next without the underscore. So, okay, that's only for Python 2. If you're using Python 3, use dunder next. Okay. All objects that have this dunder next method are called iterators. All generators, like this one, are iterators, but not the other way around. So you can have iterators that don't generate numbers. For example, if you modify your first number generator to, to return part of a list, like first hundred iterator, not generator, you can have an init method here that says self.numbers is um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Obviously, it's not, not first 100. Let's say first 5 iterator. Self i is 0. So that's the index at which we're going to start returning, 0. And the numbers that we're returning are from 1 to 5. And then, again, the next method here is just going to say if i is less than len of self.numbers, return self.numbers i. Right? Else, raise stop iteration. Sorry, you can't see that that well. Um, but there we go. So, all we're doing here is we're not generating anything. We're saying if i is less than... Uh, and by the way, we have to... Of course, we have to do this. Uh, i plus equal 1. And return current. We have to increment 1. And uh, we have to increment i by 1, of course. Again, we're not generating new numbers. We're keeping track of i, the index we're currently at. You have to do that somehow in order for... This should be self.i, by the way. You can tell that I've not actually prepared this example, but I just wanted to show you quickly that not all generators, not all iterators have to be generators. In this case, you're not generating the numbers, you're returning them from a list. So, just a quick example there. You'll have this in the sample code for this section, if I can remember to add it in. So, that... Here, what, what we do when we define the next method is we define an iterator, something that you can go over one by one by calling the next function. It doesn't necessarily have to generate all its numbers, but it can. 
but again, it can also return them from a list or from a set or anywhere else. So, in Python, it's important. Iterators are those objects that have a dunder next method. You can call next on them. We have ourselves an iterator, but we cannot do for i in my gen. In my gen. You cannot do this, let me tell you that right now. If we run this, you get an error that says first hundred generator object is not iterable. I just said it's an iterator. And it is an iterator. What an iterator means is you can call the next function on it and it will give you the next value. But an iterator and an iterable are different things. You can iterate over an iterable and the iterator is used to get the next value from a sequence or from generated values. So what we've got ourselves here is an iterator, not an iterable. We're going to learn in the next video how to create an iterable so that we can loop over it or indeed do things like sum of my gen or, um, you know, whatever it is that you want to do, list of my gen. These things here need an iterable, not an iterator. So let's do that in the very next video. I'll see you there. Have a vision, think big, ignore the naysayers, and give back and change the world. Because if not us, who? If not now, when? Hi and welcome back. In this video, we're looking at iterables in Python. In the last video, we looked at iterators. So, what in the heck is an iterable? Well, an iterable is an object that has an iter method or an iter method. So, something that looks like this. Once you define this method in any object, that is now an iterable. So, let's define something here. Let's define a first hundred iterable. This first hundred iterable just is going to define this iter or iter method. And this iter method tells Python that you want to be able to iterate over this iterable, like in a for loop, or you want to do some of it, or you want to turn it into a list. What does it have to return? It has to return an iterator. So, return first hundred generator. Now, you can do something like print the sum of first hundred iterable. And it will like it. And it will tell you 4,150. You can also iterate over it using a for loop. And it will be fine. It will also give you all the numbers there. So that's what makes an iterable. Nothing magical doesn't have to do anything contrived for Python. For it to become an iterable, all you have to do is define this method. And that method has to return something that you can call next on. It has to return an iterator. All generators are iterators, so of course this can be a generator. Now, if you want to make this a bit simpler, which you can do, instead of having a separate class returning the first hundred iterator, you can ask yourself, there's this iter method here that's returning an object of this type. What is first hundred generator in the context of this class? It's a pretty vague question, but I would say it is self. Self is always the current object, and what you're doing here is you're returning an object. So surely you can do this. Now you no longer need this first hundred iterable, and you can just return first hundred generator here. And I will still like it now. Now your generator is a bit more confusing because it's both an iterator and an iterable. And that can be confusing in some cases, but it can really be really handy in others because it's, it's much shorter than having a separate class to do that for you. 
Again, the iterable returned an iterator using this iter method. So you can do that from the iterator itself as well, since self is always an iterator, because self is the object that has this dunder next method. So I mentioned much earlier in the course something about for loops and how we needed an object that had dunder len and dunder get item defined. So what's that about? Let's define another, another iterable. And it's going to have a len, a len of self.cars, and I'm going to initialize cars up here. So let's say we've got self.cars is equal to this two element list. Then we define a dunder len method, which returns the length of the list. And we also define a get item method, which takes in the index that we want to retrieve and just return self.cars i. Earlier on in the course, we looked at this and I said that when you have an object that looks like this, that has the len and the get item method, you can use a for loop on it. And indeed, if we do for car, wait, for car in another iterable, you'll see that this prints out the cars, Fiesta and Focus. So is this an iterable too? It doesn't have an iter method. It doesn't return any generator. And the answer is yes. In Python, you can have your iterables defined either with an iter method that returns an iterable, or you can have an object that has a length and a get item. Both of these are iterables, and you can use for loops, you can use sum, you can use len in them. Uh, sorry, not len, you can use um, uh, list in them. So both of these things are iterables. Okay. And now we've learned a bit about iterables, how they're different from iterators, but they are normally together hand in hand. An iterator is used to get the next value, and an iterable is used to go over all the values of an iterator. So an iterator sort of lets you go more step by step in case you want to do that by calling next. And the iterable lets you go over all of the elements. So that's it for this video. If it doesn't make much sense and you're wondering, well, why the hell am I going to need this? Don't worry. In a few sections time, you're going to be like, oh my god, this makes so much sense as we learn about asynchronous Python. I'm just giving you a few hints here. And also, when you want to use or, or go over a list that is a bit longer, you can use generators to do that. Now, let me also say, now that we're here, that instead of having my numbers equal x for x in uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, for example, this is a list comprehension. My numbers gen, you can do a generator comprehension. And this, this instance is not very, very useful. But this is now a generator object as well, which is just a shorthand for iterating over a sequence. You can do next of my numbers gen. You can print it out. Uh, so generator comprehension, a pretty popular thing to do as well. Notice the one printed out there. Um, so I just wanted to mention that this is not a tuple comprehension. This is a generator comprehension. And we can use it to create a generator object on the fly. Uh, let's just call next in this syntax as well. Again, all it does is go over this list and yield each number as you call next. So it doesn't copy the entire list, which this does. This copies the list and gives you another copy. This lets you go over it one by one without copying the entire list. Of course, this example is not very good. You could just iterate over this list since you've already got it there. But it can be useful in other cases, like when you're iterating over another generator and you want to make some changes to it on the fly. So, it uh, can be useful in some cases. We will encounter more examples of this later on. I just wanted to give you a bit of the syntax. Anyway, that's it for this video. Don't want to keep you any longer. I'll see you on the next one. Don't be, a, don't be afraid of failure. Don't be afraid of failure. You don't learn anything from your success. You learn everything from your failure. So, um, Whenever you do something that doesn't work and you slip and fall over, don't be embarrassed about it and don't be like the world is judging me because largely people don't remember the failures. 
Hi and welcome back. In this lecture, we're talking about filter. Now that we've got our generators, iterators and iterables out the way, we can start with some fun built-in functions. The filter function is a built-in function in Python that you can call from any file or program. That's what built-in means. And it takes two arguments. The first argument to the filter function is another function. And it also takes an iterable. So it goes something like this. Let's define a friends list, like Rolf, Jose, Randy, Anna, and Mary, and I know I've missed one. And now we're going to use the filter function so that we only get the friends that start with the letter R. So start with R is going to be filter, this is the function. Now, it takes a function, first argument, arg1 function that returns true or false. So the first argument to this filter function has to be another function that returns true or false, depending on what we want to filter. So let me define a function up here. Starts with r friend. Return friend dot starts with Friend dot starts with R is going to be true if this argument here starts with an R. And it's going to be false if it doesn't. So the first argument to the filter function has to be this starts with R function. And the second argument has to be an iterable. We know what these are, so friends is an iterable, because we can iterate over it, it's a list. And that's it. This is with the filter function looks like. And what it does is it only keeps the elements for which this returns true. So the first time the filter function runs through, it's going to give you Rolf. Rolf going over to the friend. Friend starts with R is going to be true. So Rolf will be kept by the filter function. Then it will go again. And this time with Jose. Jose starts with R is false. So filter will remove it and ignore it and so on for every friend here. The interesting thing is that filter actually returns a generator so that it's a bit more efficient. Instead of copying your list with only the elements you want to keep, you have to call the next start with R element so that you get the next available element, which in this case is going to be Rolf. And if you do that again, and again, you'll get Randy, and finally, you'll get this stop iteration exception that we talked about earlier on is what signals the end of a sequence or a generator or an iterator when you reach the end of it. Okay, when you do a for loop, what the for loop is doing in the background is just calling next. And as soon as you reach the stop iteration, the for loop stops and it doesn't give you the error because the stop iteration has been designed to mean that. And the for loop is a construct that uses stop iteration to know when it's reached the end. Okay. Now, of course, if you do list of start with R, then it's going to give you a list of all the elements in the generator. It's going to go through each element and it's going to put it in a new list. Now, if you do it again, what do you think is going to happen? Well, you'll get an empty list. The list object here doesn't raise the stop iteration, but it sees that the stop iteration is raised and it just doesn't give you anything. It gives you an empty list. Now, because the generator's already been used and it remembers that it's reached the end, so it can't give you anything else. This is why I explained generators, iterators, and iterables before going into this filter function. Okay. Now, of course, instead of defining a function here that takes a parameter and returns that the parameter starts with R, we could just use a lambda. This lambda function is exactly the same thing. So it takes one parameter, and after the colon, we define what it returns. And what it returns is x dot starts with r. So this is either true or false, depending on whether x starts with r. If it makes you feel better, you can call the parameter friend. And that way, maybe it's a bit clearer that this function is going to operate on these friends here. Then you no longer need that function there. And we also no longer need this comment, since we know what it means now. 
this filter function here is identical to this generator expression here, this generator comprehension that says f for f in friends if f don't starts with r. So these two are identical, okay? Here we've got ourselves a generator expression, a generator comprehension that puts each friend into a new generator, but only if f starts with r. So these two are the same. Okay. Which one is faster? Which one performs better? This one. Generator comprehension performs better, in this case, at least. And the reason for that is because you have to create this lambda function in, in this filter, and you don't have to create a lambda function in the generator expression. If you already have your function defined elsewhere in your program, the filter function can perform better. And also, in some cases, I think the filter function can be more readable. Although in many other cases, I think the list comprehension is more readable. So it's up to you which one you use. I'll normally go for the comprehensions. It's also a bit more Pythonic. And by the way, just for completeness, so it's clear exactly what's going on, these two, filter and this generator comprehension, is identical to this other function that I'm going to define is another filter function, very much like this one, that takes in a function and an iterable, and is going to iterate over the iterable, is going to check whether the function returns true or not, and then it's going to yield i at the end if the function is true. So, let's, let's imagine that we call my custom filter here. Lambda friend, friend starts with r is this function, the iterable is our friends list. We iterate over the iterable, we get the first element, that's Rolf. If func i, that is friend starts with r, is true, which it is, then we're going to yield i, that's Rolf. When we call next on this function, we're going to get Rolf, and then we're going to stop right after line 9. When we call next again, we're going to go back to the top, that's i. We're going to, uh, that's Jose, by the way, the string Jose. We're going to check if the function matches. It's going to be false. So we're not going to yield anything. We don't stop. We go over to the next element of the loop. We check if Randy starts with R, and it is, it does. So then we yield Randy and we stop. Next time we call next, we go over here and it's Anna. It's false, so we don't yield. We continue. I is Mary. It's false, so we don't yield. We continue. We reach the end. That's a stop iteration. So we reach the end of the generator object, and that's another stop iteration, which tells us that we've reached the end. So hopefully this makes sense. It is starting to get a bit more, more into what Python is all about, uh, which is this managing of data and sending data from one place to another. And yield is extremely powerful because it lets you stop and generate the values one by one without having to store them all in memory at the same time. Anyway, that's it for this video. I just wanted to show you this filter function and how it's used. And the filter function is also present in many other programming languages, so you'll, you'll see it everywhere as you, as you develop your programming skills and you continue your programming journey. And so, yeah, that's it. And I'll see you on the next video. A teacher once came to a class and asked a seven-year-old boy, Varun, what do you want to be when you grow up, Varun? Varun said, well, I want to be a multi-billionaire, madam. I want 365 cars, one for each day of the year. I want five homes, a private jet and 20 bank accounts. And Varun, I did not ask you to write an essay. I just asked what you wanted to be. The teacher then turned to a girl whose name was Pooja. Said, Pooja, please don't answer in this essay form. Tell me in two words what do you want to be when you grow up. Pooja said, Varun's wife. Hi and welcome back. In this video, we're talking about the map function. In the last video, we briefly mentioned when you would use filter or when would you use generator comprehensions. And so I wanted just to quickly say that you'll use filter when you are programming with people who haven't been programming in Python for very long, for example, programmers from other programming languages, or just when your project involves multiple programming languages. Python is one of the few programming languages that has syntax like this. 
So if you're working with many programming languages, maybe it makes sense to use the filter function and that way keep everything consistent. Use the filter function throughout all the languages you use. Also, you'll use the filter function if you have a function already defined and you don't have to create one. That way it can be a bit faster. Finally, there's also something to say for this variable that we're creating here in this comprehension. This variable is pretty pointless. So there's something to be said for not creating this variable here. It's up to you which one you go for, but the main way of deciding, I would say, is whether you're programming with other people who like filter function instead of comprehensions. If you're only programming with Python developers, use comprehensions, and if they don't like it, get them to like it, for it will generally be better. Okay, that's enough of that. Let's talk about the map function. The map function is used to take an iterable and output a new iterable, where each element has been modified according to some function. Let's take, for example, this map here. Friends, lower is going to map lambda x, x lower of friends. Again, very similar to the filter function. It also takes a function at the start that returns something and takes something as a parameter. And what it takes is each of the elements of this iterable here. So the first one is Rolf and returns Rolf all in lowercase letters. Then it takes Jose and returns it all in lowercase letters and so forth. But it produces a generator. So the first time you call next, you'll get Rolf with all lowercase. Let's do that. And as you can see, you get Rolf all in lowercase there. This is very identical to this list comprehension here. Friend lower for friend in friends. And it's of course identical to this friends lower generator comprehension. Like so. Which one should you use? This one. The generator comprehension unless you need them all to be in a list, then you can do this list comprehension. When should you use map? Again, like I said earlier, when the people in your team, the people you're working with, are accustomed to using map, that's very popular in other programming languages, or when you're working with other programming languages at the same time and you want to keep everything consistent, or when you think it's going to be more readable because some of the functions you've got defined earlier on, you can use without having to create a new Lambda function. So here's an example of another point in time where you may use map instead of filter. Let's say we've got a class user that defines an init method, uh, including a username and password. And then it's got a class method that is from dict. So given a dictionary of data, it's going to return a user object. So it's going to return CLS of data username and data password, for example. Okay. Now you've got this defined here in the user class. And given that you have a list of users like this one, I'm going to copy them from my notes just so I don't bore you typing them out. You've got Rolf and Teclado is awesome. And UR2 is the password. Given that you have this from dict function here, and you wanted to create a list of user objects from these dictionaries, you could do something like this. Uh, and that is user from dict user for, uh, sorry, this should be users list, by the way, my apologies, for user in users. And that would be fine. But I actually feel that a map could be more readable. It's also a bit shorter, but that's, that's beside the point. I just think this is more readable here because you know that you're calling this from dict function for each element in this iterable. Whereas the list comprehension, you sort of have to read it and, and you have to create this new variable that is only used for iteration and nothing else. And you're actually calling this function here. I don't know. I just feel like the map in this case is a bit more readable. So keep that in mind if you feel that way too, that sometimes a map can be a better choice than list comprehension. And that's just an example there. 
So that's it for this video. Hope you've learned something about the map function. And I'll see you on the next video. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. It's better than to do nothing. And if somebody's making fun of you because you made a mistake, don't go down because of it. If you say so what to their face, if you say yes, so what? They are powerless. Hi there and welcome back. In this video, we're talking about any and all. Those are two functions that are really straightforward, but in some cases can be really useful. The any function takes an iterable and returns true if any of its elements evaluate to true. And the all function returns true if all the elements evaluate to true. So here's an example of when it might be useful. Imagine you've got this list of friend locations. It's a list of dictionaries where each dictionary has a name of your friend and the location of the friend. Then we ask the user for their location. And then we're going to calculate which friends are in that location. So a bit of a longer list comprehension there. Just get in the friend for each of the friends in friends, if their location is equal to the your location variable that the users entered. So imagine they enter San Francisco. We're going to put in the friend object, sorry, this dictionary, for each of the friends if they are in San Francisco. Now, we could say something like, if len of friends nearby is greater than zero, that means there are at least one friend, print, you are not alone. I'll just do that so it's a bit more readable for you. However, this is not terribly nice because really what we want to do is we don't care about the length. What we care is whether there are any friends. So here is where the any function comes in handy. If any friends nearby, print you are not alone. What this is doing is it's going over each of the elements in friends nearby and it's checking whether they are truthy. Now, a truthy value, uh, notice how these things are not Boolean, so they are dictionaries. A truthy value is one that evaluates to true. So here are some values that evaluate to false. Just because there's not that many, and it's always good to know them. Zero evaluates to false when you try to get a Boolean out of it. So does none, of course. So do empty list, empty tuple, empty set. So does false. And of course, 0.0, .0 and all these type of numbers that are zero evaluate to false. You can get whether something evaluates to true or false by doing bool of zero. And so we can run that. Uh, and we can enter San Francisco. Notice how it says, you're not alone, first of all. <laughs> and then it also says false, because bool of zero is false. So that's what the any function does. It goes through each element, and it asks them if they, are, if they were a Boolean, would they be true or false? If any of them says true, then it says, okay, this is true, you're not alone. You can also say all friends nearby. But again, the friends nearby function is going to... Um, contain either zero friends or one or more friends. So all doesn't make much sense because all of your friends are going to be dictionaries. So um, if one of them is true, all of them are going to be true because they're all going to be dictionaries and dictionaries are always true unless they're empty. Any would return true if there's at least one or false if empty. So it's a pretty handy function in this case. Okay. Now, let me just delete that. And of course, all would print, for example, all of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This will print true. So I'm going to run this, uh, say San Francisco. And now notice how it says true here, because 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 are all true. But as soon as we put a zero in there and run it again, we now get false because not all of these things here are true. 
one of them is false, and that's the zero. So it can be useful in some circumstances. I just wanted you to know about this function just in case you encounter a situation where you need to use it. This is akin of me giving you some tools for you to use in your construction project. You may not need them all for one particular project, but they may be useful for other projects. And these functions are essentially those slightly more obscure tools that a lot of people don't know about, but they're still handy to know and understand that they exist. So that's it for this video, and I'll see you on the next one. You can't let your failures define you. You have to let your failures teach you. You have to let them show you what to do differently the next time. So if you get into trouble, that doesn't mean you're a troublemaker. It means you need to try harder to act right.